Bigger than ever, it's the unofficial 40 from Soonerscoop.com. Now, here's the entire Soonerscoop crew, Carrie, Josh, Eddie, and Bob. Gary Brock joined by uh, the entire crew is, uh, can you tell my voice is fully all the way back now? I was about to say, that was impressive. Uh, after that uh, endoscopy or whatever that is, like my throat was jacked up for a while. I think I should sue. Maybe there was some damage done there. Anyway, welcome back. Uh, we are the Unofficial 40 Podcast. By the way, uh, now going to be on YouTube and YouTube Music. I've got most of that fixed. All the archives are not completely up yet because I have to switch a couple of things. Uh, we had a little, we were little copyright violators back in the day uh, in the early shows. A lot of stuff on there that uh, <laughs> got flagged when we put it on YouTube. Uh, so that's cool, but no video yet. That's happening. You know, the studios are coming along. I sent out a couple pictures the last couple of days. I have Josh. You you let me know what you think, uh, business partner Josh. It's a business partner meeting right now. I really think I got a little little uh, spark of uh, of um, imagination. Is there an right word? Spark of a uh, I don't know a spark. Uh, but I feel like we should make our own little weather set that's just for like breaking news. So it gives mm-hmm. Eddie a chance to to troll all the weather channels in the state. I think I'm being used as a gateway for Carrie just to spend more money, Josh. <laughs> I mean, we got to spend the money anyway, so we might as well be creative. What do you I, think, George? I'm looking at Terry's post from yesterday and just like, I want to make a one-for-one. G- g- no. God, no, we're no. not doing a Stop. one-for-one, but we can get a damn weather desk <laughs> that sure. has the two little TVs there and then a TV behind him, like a green screen. We could do like a really poorly constructed green screen where it's like it like doesn't really work all that well. We oh, had a green God. screen back in the uh, Scoop Studio days over at your uh, your house, didn't we? Uh, yeah, well, like I'm, in the. I'm kind somewhere. of half kidding. Green screens are easy to do. Yeah, we used to do all that stuff. <clears throat> we did have a green screen. We do have a green screen. I think you we could currently be have really creative screen. with it, though. I think there's some potential there. I think we should just uh, get the floors and the doors up first, and then we'll see. You George. can pipe down, George. It's not your money. That's, That's my, my guy, done. Stoya. It's not That's your my money. Guy. One thing at a time. <laughs> all but right. I like the dream, I, big. I, I, I'll, dream big. I'll give a shout out to all you, uh, you. I think your brother, is it your brother-in-law that's in construction, Josh? Brother. My brother. Or just brother. brother. Okay. I, I, I admire the hell out of him the more that I've gone through this because it's like what happens is you tell one group, I want it done this way. And then they decide to change their mind, regardless of what you tell them. And then you have to work with another crew and say, "Well, they screw this up," or you know, they have to reinforce, and you have to go back to the other. Crew. It's just a, it's a constant. I feel like I'm a a kindergarten teacher at times. Not that these are kindergarten. Yeah. Not that not well, that we're doing any child labor practices here at Sooner Scoop. <laughs> Should be. there's a there's a twofold problem. So my brother has to work for rich ass women who. Oh, are changing boy. their minds. They have oh, all these boy. ideas. They've got to juggle all of that. And then at the same time, the the problem so often is finding consistent labor, like finding oh, yeah. the guy who will, you know, you know, like, oh, this guy's great at floors, but he hasn't shown up to work for the last four days. Like, and there's a variety of reasons for that, but they're never good. Like, there's never <laughs> like, you know, like, oh, my kid was sick. It's never that. So it's uh th- there is a problem a, i have been ghosted them. by a concrete guy right now i'm 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 mm-hmm. now i'm having to move to other concrete guys so he he might be in prison i am i'm not not saying he is we're not naming names but it's possible so uh I, the, the stories is, i've heard is it 
No, no, oh, no. It's I not thought like you were Josh and I have discussed I this. this. Like a serious conversation. No, he just pulled that out of his ass oh, just now. No. I was very intrigued. Yeah, I was like, the guy walked in a couple <laughs> yeah. days ago. This guy's in prison already. Eddie, if you think Josh and I are having construction meetings every day, you have, you have a, a really warped sense of how together we are as a company. Uh, Eddie, yeah. My mental state, I couldn't handle that. I, I, I'm th There's a reason I can stay upbeat. It's because I don't know what Carrie's doing half the time. <laughs> I and it man it, I managed to stay positive because of I it. I think we are manifesting a summer series where you come up here and you just stay at the office for a week. Oh, God. Be like, like, like he has uh, to live here? Well, no. I mean, he could get a hotel room or something. But uh, just sure. comes in daily. It could be like a... Uh, What's it called? Uh, Just goes Ed on TV, a rampage. Like the Ed TV. Remember that movie right. or whatever? It'd be like that. Mm -hmm. it, a reality show. A perhaps. reality show. Yes. Yeah, but Josh in office. I got you. I, I will I say. I mean, George wants that to the, happen right now. He wants the cameras following us around all the time. I do. I, I didn't you say that. You said that many times to me. I mean, we I should think. film this. We should just film. I think. I think when we're working and doing stuff on game days, we should definitely do like vlogs and stuff. I think that'd be fun. I don't know about in the office because a lot of times we're not doing a whole lot in the office. We're just kind of just hanging fighting out. to stay away. I do think yes. the uh, the schedule <laughs> allows George's. for a little bit more vlogging. Maybe when we go to some of these new places that uh, I, think I yes, simply haven't stuff, been. Yeah. I think they hit a little bit mm -hmm. differently than uh, yeah. maybe going to Cincinnati or wherever. Although Cincinnati was yeah, a fun trip. Have we talked about like almost going like early, you know, like earlier than normal just to like no, soak I, it all I up like that, that idea. I, I I've mean, said it before, like a summer trip in an RV through SEC But territory. I think Josh is saying like go on a, be, get there on a Thursday. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. To where, you know, the road trip. <laughs> I don't think that we're going to be able to go to many places where we uh, go, okay, like back in the old days where it's like midnight the night before the game and it's like, all right, let's get on the road. Let's get out there. <laughs> Let's get to Lawrence. <laughs> Let's get to Oxford. Yeah. Well, don't forget that midnight departure was supposed to be at 5 p.m., Eddie. So that that's important to that's acknowledge fair. as well. That's there, fair. There was. Uh -huh. That's the good old days when we were all young and you know we could <laughs> we could drive from Arizona to San Antonio all night long. Oh my God, that's still the craziest. I mean, shit that you could guys still ever. be done. I love doing that in I mean, certain uh, circumstances. The only thing that would piss me off is that Eddie slept the whole way. Like, and I didn't care that he slept. I just didn't have anybody to talk to. I, but I guess that's the only way I could, anyway, listen to my music that I want to listen to instead of. We just, we anyway, I'm not getting into all Let's that. welcome everybody back into the pod now. Welcome everybody. You can, Eddie is marking, you can start <laughs> listening here on the rundown right now. <laughs> Uh, we just had a commitment uh, right before we were actually waiting to podcast. Uh, and we, Josh, this is this is your sh this is one shining moment for you. Uh, we're starting off the pod, and you are the bearer of uh, good news. Yeah, Oklahoma lands the commitment of Frisco Emerson defensive back Malik Hawkins. Um, you know, obviously, younger brother of freshman quarterback Michael Hawkins, son of former Oklahoma corner uh, Michael Hawkins Senior. Uh, Malik is a, a really interesting guy. You know, I know we've got his commit breakdown video up on the board or up on the site. It's on the board as well for, uh, for Crimson Corner posters. Um, when you watch him, the thing that it, I guess it shouldn't be surprising. His father played in the NFL. He's been around football and been around, you know, a pros since he was a baby, but he's just so, He's one of those guys, like, usually when I watch a young DB, they can play press, or they can play off, or they can play, you know, corner or safety. He really does all of them, and he does them pretty well, and you can see there's kind of a comfort level. He's still got a lot to figure out. I mean, I think kind of figuring out what his best role is is going to be a an interesting thing for Jay Valai and Brandon Hall to kind of work themselves through. But um, he, he's he's an interesting guy. Got great size, can be physical with some of those bigger receivers. So there's um there's stuff to like here. I know people will kind of wonder, oh, is this you know a continuation of recruiting Mike? You know, last year that that's not my impression. That that's I think OU legitimately likes him and sees some promise in him. And obviously, you know the the family connection there. I I, I mean, was there ever any doubt in this thing, or was there some work that kind of had to be done. I mean, we all know, you know, Michael is a guy, you know, his dad is very much into his career and uh I'm, you know, I'm not throwing accusations, I'm not saying things like helicopter, but I mean, obviously they had as much as you hear about, you know, Michael Hawkins and, you know, really being aggressive about, you know, 
pursuing a job with this this Oklahoma football team and battling uh, Jackson Arnold, like whatever you feel is on the outside, the family's got to be pretty happy with Oklahoma for this to happen. Yeah, I mean, a- absolutely. I mean, and I think that's something that Eddie and uh, George and I talked about on Monday in the recruiting report is that this is a good indicator of while some people kind of said, oh, well, you know, Mike Jr. is going to come in there for a year and once Arnold wins that job outright, he's going to look around. I, they're making plans for the future. I mean, they're making plans for beyond this year. So I, I think that is kind of worth acknowledging and looking at. And again, all the reviews we hear of Mike Jr. have just been outstanding. I mean, he he really has come in and I think surprised a lot of people, myself included, with how, how well he has hit the ground running in Oklahoma. Um, so yeah, I, I think it's a very good sign. And I think again, um, it is, this is something, I mean, I've talked to Mike senior about it before. Like this is something he's prepared these guys for since they were little, you know, he, he, Terry, you remember him as a recruit, like Mike was just absurdly gifted and really didn't have anyone to kind of direct, you know, push him in a direction and kind of teach him the right way to do things. Very he was just blessed with un- yeah. Yes. But one of and I mean I and I for people that don't remember Mike Mike Hawkins Sr. is one of the most naturally gifted corners I've ever seen. Like he he really it, it's staggering how good he could have been if everything fell right for him. Um and you know with Malik like I said very different kind of player kind of a safety hybrid uh, corner combo. I compared him to Brian Jackson in the commit breakdown carry for kind of a bigger guy, physical guy, um, you know, probably not the, like the turn and run type of corner, but if he can body you up a little bit and get in into you a little bit, I think he can be a, a good corner. I think he can play safety if that's what you needed. So again, there's, there's, um, there's plenty to say that this, this can turn out really good for both Hawkins brothers at Oklahoma, because again, they have a lot of options at corner and this is a commitment they were willing to take, you know, with guys like Kobe Sellers, Tristan Haynes, uh, Cortland Guillory, all still out there for Oklahoma. So we've talked about, uh, you know, how Oklahoma, you know, could be filling up before the, you know, start of the season, even recruiting wise, you add him now Hawkins to Wimberley, uh, and you're still out there looking at Jonah Williams, which, you know, we've discussed a lot, linebacker safety, Recruited as a safety, don't know about his baseball future. Uh, but how many more spots are left in the secondary now? Well, I mean, it, it really does. It starts to get really interesting as you look at it because, you know, you like you mentioned, you get um, uh, uh, Marcus Wimberly over the weekend. You get Malik Hawkins. You've got your corner, your first corner, your first safety. But like I mentioned, I, I think Oklahoma's – probably only thinking to take maybe two corners and three if numbers just worked out perfectly. And you, like I said, you've still got Cortland Guillory, who was on campus last week, and you've got Tristan Haynes, the Carl Albert pro- product, who I think has just elite, elite potential, but he's very raw right now. There's still a lot he's learning and picking up on. And then you've got Kobe Sellers, who I think is Oklahoma's probably top target at corner uh, and is a really good natural cover corner guy out of Peril and Shadow Creek in Houston. So you've got three guys for maybe just one spot and at best two. So there's going to have to be some, you know, I, I don't know if Oklahoma, I, I maybe at this point they go to these guys and say, hey, look, this is our situation. This is what we've got. We'd love to take all of you. We just can't. So this is, you know, it, and I think, Especially in the case of Haynes and Sellers, I think it's so close that OU would kind of just say, hey, guys, it's first come. Like, well, whatever you can do, let's do it. Um, and then at safety, I still think they would take three. I, I, I There's no way they're going to say Jonah Williams, no thanks. Like, that's just not going to happen. Yeah. And so you would expect a Marion Robinson. He'll probably make his call sometime this summer. And Jonah... You know, the last time I spoke to him a couple weeks ago about this, he was talking about seeing OU in the fall. So, and probably using an official visit to do so. Now, with Jonah, it, it's always a little tough that, you know, kind of when you think you know what he's doing, he kind of pivots on you a little bit. So, I don't want to count as anything, is that's definitely what's going to play out. And I do know Oklahoma's trying to get him to come up for the Champion Barbecue and kind of change some of his official visit plans around. Um, we'll, we'll see. Like I said, it's all really interesting with with Jonah and I think the defensive the good news for OU fans that are listening 
it's going to be a really good defensive back class. I'm not certain how it plays out, but I, I have no doubt that they have more than enough good players for the spots they have available. And look, I mean, we, we've been out of practice. I mean, we're going to be out again Friday. Uh, by the way, a little note. You know, was it last Tuesday, last time that we were out there and talked to Brent? Was that Tuesday yes. or Monday? Tuesday. So it's yeah. been over a week since we've been out there. Uh, we'll get a viewing on Friday and we'll get some interviews on Friday. We don't know exactly who that will be, but we were supposed to do it today. Uh, there's terrible weather outside. Terrible weather, but they're expected to scrimmage today. So I don't know how that situation is going to go. It's interesting. It's their third scrimmage. Right. Do they usually scrimmage that many times in spring? About once a week, Usually right? three scrimmages, three major scrimmages in spring. Yeah. But, I mean, that would say that they're not going to scrimmage. And then they usually have one after the spring game if they don't like what they see. You know, or they feel like there's some areas they can get better in. But the point I was starting was we've been out there. We've seen with our own eyes the upgrade in talent in the secondary. Uh, and I don't know, Josh, do you feel like that it gives Oklahoma and, and the coaching staff and, and, you know, Brandon Hall and Jay Valai and, uh, I mean, Brent's no stranger to, you know, evaluating secondary guys. And obviously safety is, you know, can kind of be like a linebacker at times in his defense. Um but is it almost give them some confidence to to stick behind some evaluated guys versus just chasing, uh, you know, the 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 five star left and right that might take them some time to land? I, I think there's a lot of confidence in a couple of different ways, guys, because unlike some other positions that we talk about, OU chasing in the portal, where offensive linemen, defensive linemen, quarterbacks, they're hard to find because there's just not enough of them to go around. At DB, you can find good players. I mean, it, it, clearly Des Malone's impressing everybody. We know Kanai Walker's come in and been a good player for Oklahoma. Yeah, the portal's uh, you know, been you good. Can go them, down yeah. the list. Yeah, I mean, so there is. I think it allows Oklahoma to be like, these are our guys. We want Kobe Sellers. We want Tristan Haynes. We want Cortland Guillory. But if we don't get them, we know we can circle back around. And, you know, in the portal next year, we can find a guy to fill a hole if we feel like we've got one. As to where five years ago, you kind of got to have those backup plans because you're, you know, if we miss Kobe Sellers, if we miss Tristan Haynes, we don't have an answer. We can't just go fix our problem through, you know, another team's roster. We've got to have backup plans and we've got to go with a player that we don't like as much. And so I think that's what Oklahoma's kind of doing here is just saying we, and again, I don't think it's going to burn them. I think they're going to end up just fine for it, but I think it allows them to be a little more dogged about a top four or five at any position and not have to worry about, you know, oh, we got to have some fallback positions here if, if things really go bad. Somebody in particular, uh, just in terms of the quarterback position, Tristan Haynes from Carl Albert. I know that you know we had talked to him, or maybe not talked to him, but obviously went and saw him in the state championship game. It seemed like over the course of January and February, things were getting more serious about Oklahoma, just in terms of their interest. Uh, do you think that that's still a pretty comfortable situation with all of the uh, guys over there at Carl Albert? I do. I mean, I know, you know, Marcus James is working on him. I know Trene Washington. I mean, that, that whole crew. I mean, we, we know that they're all very tight and, you know, they all definitely want him in, you know, and he's been on several trips with the guys. Um, I need to actually sit down with Tristan a little bit, kind of just catch up and see where he's at. It, he's been kind of quiet here lately. Um, but no, I, I don't think there's any question that Oklahoma still very much wants him, still very much in that race. It's just a matter to me of, and, and I, you wonder now, now, I mean, and it's not that Oklahoma found out like the rest of us with Malik Hawkins, obviously they, they knew what was going on, but I think they now have to kind of look at it because it's always shifting guys. Like that's something people always want me to like, Josh, how many are they going to sign in this class in the 2026 class? I'm like, guys, there are so many variables that's tough to know in this class because there gets to a point and we talk about this every year where it's not just we have a need, it's you start weighing, okay, is the fifth best linebacker we could get a better scholarship spot than the number four corner? I sure. mean, like you, you start, it almost turns into NFL draft conversation where it's need versus best available, and OU has to kind of weigh that out a little bit, and they have to weigh it again 
against portal departures, portal entries. I mean, there's a lot of roster management, and that's why we we talk so much about these, you know, director of football ops and these guys that have to not only have the intel on what might happen in the future, but they have to have a good grip on where the roster is right now. You know, I'm trying to think about this, Josh. I, George, maybe you know this. The the recruiting calendar. Are we under right now a proposal to move it to move the dates like a summer signing? Is that because I know you get into a committee and you have proposals and they either pass or they don't. I don't think where we're sitting now they voted for anything to change. But aren't there some some proposals out there about you know moving the signing days? I want to say they changed it. Did they? Didn't, did didn't they that change happen? it officially? Bob would know for sure. I'm I'm terrible about these things, but I jump in. I want to say, yeah, the first Wednesday, yeah. December. It's going to be mm-hmm. championship game weekend for yeah. yeah whatever teams are still involved. So they just moved up yeah. to December. Yes, they haven't done anything about summer. They still have February. No, they no, don't have a no summer. No August or anything. Still, yeah, first Wednesday, February, first one okay. day. Wednesday, December. I appreciate you not yelling. Yeah, we, that from we were in the same room. boat there, Carrie. I was crossed up because I was like, I am almost certain November's happened, but for some reason the summer part was thrown. I off. just remember there was some talk we about got the Bob summer. Here to fact check us. Well, the reason the reason I brought that up is because I am really curious, like what this spring portal is going to look like in football, uh, because I think I think we saw most of the big name movement that we're going to see. Although you know the Bear Alexander stuff that we were talking about yesterday, I don't think we're any. I think there's going to be a lot more. Movement. You think there's going to? You think it's going to even increase? Oh yeah, I mean the guys that are in the portal are now just have been in the portal shy. since like January. Some yeah. of the guys. I mean, I I think you're going to see on April 16th when it opens. You're going to. I mean, I'm not saying it's going to be like the you know winter portal after the season, but I do think you're going to see some big names get in there. Well, and I'm just curious, like how. Because it's it's clear Brent's adapted to this. I mean, he's not the guy that and we've talked about this. He's not the guy he announced he, or he he kind of portrayed himself as being when he got introduced to, at his press you know hiring press conference. Like he's embraced the portal. He's they're bring. I mean, heck, they brought guys in last weekend. Uh, it, it's like, how are they going to adjust in terms of leaving roster spots open? Uh, you know, when they are recruiting so well. Do they kind of put the brakes on things? It doesn't. I mean, you take the Lake Hawkins. It doesn't appear they're putting the brakes on anything. The big question to be is how much, and hopefully nobody from the NCAA is listening to this, but <laughs> you have some needs on the offensive line. How active are you in uh, contacting a go-between or a manager for a player that's currently on a roster and saying, "Hey, we'll give you X amount of money. You want to come play? We need you." We need it. We need an offensive tackle or an offensive center or whatever. Like just straight out. Well, I mean, let's not, let's not, it, that, that happens. happens. Yeah. yeah, that happens. Yeah. Get in on the game, OU. That's what you're saying. I mean, I think that they're in a position right now where they. they I don't want to say have to, but they, they need have to. to. I would be urgent about it. Yeah, I think they have to on the offensive line, especially. I think defensive line. If you can add a guy, great. It would be helpful to get somebody in there with experience, but offensive line has been. I don't want to say disaster, but they've. But got, I mean, but you say it's that borderline. They brought in Spencer Brown. They brought in. I mean, they brought in what four guys from the portal. And yeah, I would just they say that more. they haven't. I, I would know. say it hasn't worked <laughs> out. Particular. I mean, we haven't even seen Landon Hatchet out. There. Not Landon. I keep saying Landon. Garen Hatchet Garen out Hatchet, there. Yeah. Um, you know, Spencer Brown I think hasn't. I just heard Bob mumble from the other room. Spencer. <laughs> Spencer Brown hasn't been um, as good. Fabici's been awesome. Wee woo. Um, and who's the fourth one? Tarquin. 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 I think Tarquin's been better than maybe some, or he's been about what they expected. But they just need more, they just need more bodies up there. Just like I, I posted on the board, they're you know maybe talking to this kid from uh, UNLV, the left guard, Alani Makaheli. I think is how you say his name. I you know I don't think they need things, a ton George. of guard, but they just need bodies. There's two things, George. They don't need just tackles and depth. They need a freaking center. They're well, yeah. not going to have a center ready to go for the start of the season, most likely. Well, the well, yeah. Right now on roster, I mean, they don't. A hundred percent healthy. I don't think Everett's going to be there. No, but that's why, that's why they're bringing in the kid from SMU, SMU right? Branson right. Hickman. But add him. I mean, yeah, you get that guy. But is he just another Tarquin? Is he just another okay guy? I, mean, I, I think that 
if he were to step in today, he'd be the starter. But you, but yeah, that's not saying a whole lot, though. But, what? I, but they have no other options. I mean, to be a difference maker, right? Yeah, I don't think he is. Like, I, I think he's, he's a, a solid player. Don't get yeah, me wrong, solid player. But he's not SEC level starting center. No. I don't think they. I, they may not have one on roster. To be completely blunt, they may not have a lot of things on roster on the offensive line. Right. That's what I'm saying. That's why they have to go. That's why I'm saying that they have got to go get people in the portal. I don't. Again, I I think that they're waiting and seeing too, to see if there's more guys that go and enter, or like Eddie said, maybe they're they're already you know kind of tampering. That could be happening. That tamper, tamper all yes. you can. Tamper, tamper. Uh, you know what they need. You know uh, what the staff needs right I mean, what's now. What's the worst that could happen? They tell you to stop. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> truly. And then you go to court. The NCAA and then the NCAA changes the rule. That's but what's when it comes happen. to evaluating who can be a difference maker, like maybe you even have to turn down this SMU kid. Like, say we have to do better. We need to put the money somewhere because they're going to have to pay him money. They're going. They're still in a bidding war with other people for this kid. Like. Are you getting in bidding wars with guys that aren't really difference makers? That's my question right now. And you know what you need in order to to decipher whether or not this is a good situation with the SMU guys, uh, SMU Center. You need vision. Well, uh, you, just like Enjoy provides vision for people like Eddie Radosevich. Uh, it's our fresh perspective look around uh, with Mister Eddie Radosevich, who sees things very clearly. You need money, but maybe if you go to Enjoy, you'll have plenty of money to spend on offensive linemen because they're giving you such a good deal on enjoy vision lasik which is the best laser vision center in oklahoma city not even close the combination of mind-blowing technology experienced eyeball surgeons and exceptional patient care was life-changing for me what enjoy is doing for the unofficial 40 listeners they're giving 400 dollars off of lasik all you got to do is go to enjoywithme.com that is the letter n j o y with me.com and use promo code u40 for 400 dollars off lasik Enjoy vision. This is where you lace it. So, I mean, yeah, I think there are hard questions that have to be asked right now. I mean, I, I, if you don't have, I mean, what? Well, let's let's talk about it. what we've heard in camp is the offensive line has been at times terrible, and I think it also makes you question what you have at quarterback when you don't have an offensive line that's capable of keeping a clean pocket for a quarterback, uh, and that might be where some of the talk about Jackson Arnold having some struggles. Uh, and Michael Hawkins looking so good come from uh, because they're not working with a 1A and a 1... I mean, it's more like a 1A and a 1B offensive line they're working with. They're working with a mishmash of people because they're trying to develop an offensive line, and I don't know, out of 10 guys that they rotate in and out of there, I don't know that they have five that are worthy of starting. That is, I think, becoming maybe over the last week and a half the biggest storyline of the spring yeah is because Oklahoma has not had an offensive line that is adequate enough during the spring is Jackson Arnold truly developing is he taking the next step into what is going to be a gargantuan position just in terms of how far this offense or how far this team can go because of the offense like is he in a Bryce Young situation where he's been drafted by a uh, a team that has no offensive line to protect him and his development is just going to shit. Well, the I, Panther, I, the Pan I think it's a serious question, but I also think it's probably one of those that we're going to have this conversation and people are going to run with it in a direction that we're probably not going as a whole. The Panthers had a lot else going on wrong there too. Organization. The idea but, though is uh, the same. Yes. I mean, look, my point previously was if you can get the SMU center, you take him because right now, currently, as we sit here today, he is the best center in the in the transfer in the portal. portal. Now, if you can go out and get a different guy, you get a different guy to go in the portal. You tamper, yes, and you do that. But if come next week and he's visiting on spring game weekend, you I think you just have to take him. I mean, it's 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 a no brainer. He started thirty three games, and it's just like some of these other guys. You just have to take some of these bodies. And hope that they can develop into something maybe more than what they what they look like. I, I just you can't. You How can't many bank years on does the SMU guy have? One year. So he's a rental. Yes. I mean, I agree. You have to take him, especially your situation at center. You have to take this guy because Bates doesn't sound like to be the answer. Everybody else is too young. I don't think they have a guy with the right body type to make the move. Like Eugene Brooks can't make the move to center. He's too big. He's worked a little bit at center, hasn't he? Uh, I mean, a 
occasionally during the it's spring. Been I don't think he's Josh going to be a, right. I don't think he's going to be a center. No, which I Sosa is not tiny. I mean, but he has been working. But true freshman. I mean, I just I don't think. Well, that's I mean, work. we know. Uh, like, just look at Eugene Brooks High School t- tape versus Josh I Sosa. They're on different planets. Could Jose? I mean, we've we've talked about that, Josh, in in recruiting reports before. Oh yeah, I mean they're the. I mean to me. If you didn't find someone in the portal, Eugene Brooks would be getting a very serious look at center for me. Like I, he he has the body and the strength to hold up there. And I'm now you've got to see if he can actually do it or not. He's just too big. What about what about Heath Ozeda? Could he play center? I think he's too big. He's awfully long. Like he he's I mean because he almost looks like a tackle yeah. already. I mean like he's so big and it just. He'd be kind of a funny body type. Maybe Hatchet can. I, we haven't heard anything about Hatchet yeah. really. I don't think he's been able to he, do he a whole lot. He hasn't practiced it. That's what I'm saying. It's like we there's sure. I'm sure they don't know if he can play. But again, you fall back on this idea: is he going to be the savior when you know he gets to nut cut in time in September? Is his brother a center, Landon? I believe so. Yes. You know what would be interesting Damn. though is if Casey Thompson were practicing, because then you'd have someone truly to compare. Any kind of struggles that Jackson Arnold was having or any other quarterback, if Casey Thompson was practicing, you could say, okay, he's not able to function in the offense. This offensive line really is a problem. But you don't have that. I mean, you can tell I mean, I regardless. I think that we would but, be in the same position that we're in right now is just saying the offensive line has been so bad that it's hard to really tell what you have. I, I agree, yeah. I mean, I, and it's a little, it's I think a they're little, struggling to just run the football for three yards. It's a little scary knowing what that's going to look like as the public watches it. In a week and a half. Yeah. I think it will be. Because everyone will make I think it'll be out. really telling if they, and I don't think that they have announced like how they're going to keep score and what the teams are going to be, that kind of stuff. It's going to be really interesting to see how they uh, maybe try to cover up some things. I was about to say, I, I think that they can, they can script the hell out of the spring sure. game. Sure. Mm-hmm. But a lot of rollouts, a lot of moving the pocket. Yeah. I mean, I think that the defense will excel like we've heard out of the first two scrimmages that they basically dominated. Now, a lot of that is what you get during the spring, during this time of the year. But at the same time, I just thinking about what's to come and what's coming in August and September. It's I mean, it, they hit the ground running. It's not like I think that T- Temple's going to come in here and beat them or Tulane or anything like that. But they're at least breathing Division one players. I just think, look, out of everything that we're watching in spring practice, we go out there and we see a, a wide receiver room that looks extremely deep. I mean, sure. we haven't even really talked that much about Jaden Gibson, and every time they're doing one-on-one stuff, he, I, he, you know, you see something out of him. When uh, he had a long, I mean, to be fair, as we sit here and shit on the offensive line, they, you know, they did put out a clip the other day, and and we heard that we, I mean, I put the notes up on the scrimmage. I mean, he caught like a 40-yard touchdown pass mm-hmm. from Jackson Arnold in the scrimmage last week. That's a, that's another thing is like when we talk about this offensive line sucking, I to a certain extent, that's basically what we're saying. I don't think it's like the worst offensive line in the country. No. I don't think it's the worst offensive line and, maybe in the SEC. And I, I would say but to too, get to where, where Oklahoma should be or where it needs to be, it's they got a ways. I, I still think that they have some pieces that can work. Like I think that they are pretty good at guard. And I think they're actually pretty good at left tackle. Like I think Michael Tarquin's actually been a little bit better than they expected. And if Jacob Sexton can be what he was last year and maybe a little bit better, maybe he can move to right tackle. I don't know. Maybe Tarquin can play right tackle. I mean, those two could be your tackles. And then all of a sudden you just need a center. And I know that's a huge if, right? But right now, I, I think that if you look at if they can replace center, if they can get somebody in for Everett, and then if they can go find somebody at right tackle, then you're sitting in, in a decent spot. Like they just have to, you just have to hope that somebody you know exceeds expectations and um, that it kind of comes together. I I'm just not hitting the panic button just yet. They've not been great, obviously, but I I, I don't think it's time to just totally hit the panic button. Josh, uh, did we just? Are we at that place now where you realize uh, I'll pick on your your former team, Michigan State, uh, that maybe with Spencer Brown, you know, transferring out, like maybe that program was so far down that you know he's just not that good. The concern. I mean, it's too. I, that, that's harsh for me to say because we haven't seen enough yeah. of him to know. 
Uh, yeah, I haven't heard anything like. But Spencer yeah, Brown's I haven't heard like awful. Spencer Brown shouldn't be. Out but of I don't. Just, he's just to working they, a lot with the second team. That's the only they, thing that we really know. And about to think him. that they got like Walter Rouse, the second coming of Walter Rouse. I think that that's not true either. Right, and I, I just think yes. that like the thing with Spencer Brown and Jacob Sexton is both of them have been working a lot with the second team. We haven't heard that they've just been terrible. We just heard that they've not been working. And again, it kind of goes back to Kerry's point. It's like I think they're doing a lot of mixing and matching right now to figure out. Who can do what with what unit? I, I don't know. But I, I don't think any of us would say that he's been terrible. But he's definitely, like Eddie said, he's not Walter Rouse like we maybe first anticipated. Uh, and that that's the deal to me. First, uh, you guys are right. Anybody that created this narrative that, well, he's going to step in like Walter Rouse, didn't watch the tape. He, he's not Walter Rouse. He never was. Uh, he was more raw. There was more that needed to be done there. I mean, like, I, I thought... Now, don't get me wrong. I thought he would come in and take the right tackle job. Like now, I thought it would be one of those deals by midseason. You're like, okay, this guy's playing pretty good football. But I thought there would be some growing pains because, again, he was not nearly as good and nearly as ready as Walter Rouse was. I, I thought Walter Rouse was an underappreciated get when they got him. I liked him quite a bit. Um, so I, that that comparison was always a little unfair. What concerns me though is. I mean, there were some other options out there, guys. There were some other tackles. I'm not saying a lot of great ones, but this is the guy Oklahoma focused on from very early on. And for him to come in and not beat out Jake Taylor, who, guys, I, we all know I loved as a high school recruit, but I think he's a guard, first of all. And secondarily, he has never really forced his way onto the field at Oklahoma, and he can't seem to get in front of Jake Taylor. I I, I don't know. That's a red flag to me. Like that, That feels like... A guy with that much experience, that much playing time. I know he doesn't know the offense. I know there's a lot of things he's learning and all those things. I, I get it. But it doesn't change that it's not like Jake Taylor has all these built in advantages. He's got no experience. He's, you know, just all this stuff that I, I, I don't know. I, it, to me, it's a, I, I'm more panicked than George is. I guess I would say it that way. I, I think the offensive line's a huge concern. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it's not a huge concern. I just think sure, that... Sure, I, I, I didn't mean it like that. It, yeah, yeah, but... Is a huge concern, though, the difference in 7-8 wins versus 9-10 and 10 wins? Yes. That's what we're talking about. Not I as think opposed so. to, like, 9-10 yeah. and 10 wins and the other side of it being this team goes 4-8 and eight next year. Or 6-5 yeah, and, five yeah, and like seven. like something yeah, drastically, yeah, yeah. drastically bad. D Josh, let me ask you this. If Michael Tarquin and Jacob Sexton end up being their two best tackles, where would you prefer each of those guys play? Because I think there's a scenario where both those guys end up starting, one at left, one at right. Uh, and I would agree with you. I would probably – now, with Oklahoma's system, and I know it's something Bill's talked about a lot publicly, that – Right and left, or he doesn't see it like you know the old you know the blind side stuff. Like that's not the way he looks at it. So I think that has to be said. But just knowing what we know and having a young quarterback, I would feel better if Jacob Sexton took that left tackle job. Like I, I just think he's a better player. He's a little more athletic. Um, and I, I will say, you know, there's been a lot of questions like where is he? I, I talked to some people. It, it sounded like he had a little uh, kind of you know, nagging thing early in camp, but it sounds like they think he's back to full speed now. So hopefully he starts to kind of pick up and, and, you know, playing a little cleaner, a little better. Um, but yeah, and, and Tarquin has experience on the right side. I think Tarquin's better on the left or he seems more comfortable there anyway. But to me, the difference between that, I, I, I mean, I just think Sexton's better at left tackle. And if you've got to work out whatever's going to be at right tackle, then you kind of go from there, in my opinion. Yeah. Well, that would, that's good news. I think Sexton's the, the main thing, and look, it, it, we're not trying to do an offensive line doom pod. We're just trying to get people I think this ready. Is a reality for, pod. It is a yeah, reality. Yeah, we're trying to get people yeah. ready for what they're gonna see, you know, on the twentieth. And it might be like they just don't put their better defensive ends out there, uh, or you know, they play a lot of backups at defensive tackle, so it doesn't look so lopsided. Uh, and like you know, like you were saying, George, they can they can kind of engineer it to look the way they want it to look. Uh, but we're just we're just trying to tell you from what we hear on a daily basis in practice, it's affected the 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 ability of the quarterbacks to to make consistent plays. Now I think that like you said, the big plays do happen. It's just 
with young quarterbacks, you would like to know that they're getting a little bit more consistent practice time in the pocket and not just always having to get rid of and we don't know. Maybe maybe the, Michael the, Hawkins is better at identifying, you know, receivers than than Jackson Arnold is. I don't know, but obviously you hear a lot more positive things about Michael Hawkins, and we all do, than you do about Jackson Arnold. And I was reminded this morning that the same thing kind of happened a year ago with Jackson. Everybody was super excited about Jackson. And then, oh, yeah. You know, I remember never really last talked year, about Dylan Gabriel coming out of the spring. I remember last year, everyone was coming up to me like on the side and saying, look, don't go out and say this, but Jackson Arnold looks really yeah. good. Yeah. And, and I, you know, the, uh, the flip side of all of this conversation could be maybe OU just has a top five defense. I don't think that's the case. But if you want to, if, if we want to, like, they're going to be, like, I think, going there? I'm not saying they're going to be top five. I think they're going to be pretty good. I, I think the defensive line is going to determine that, the depth yeah. there. And I, mean, I just, if they had two more bodies, and we talked about this, I think, last week, if they had two more bodies on the interior, just with experience. If they just had a, it, a, a Jacob couple Lacey of and, DeJon uh, Terry's. Jacob Lacey and maybe Jonah comes is back for another year. Yeah. Or, uh, you know, Q Overton to a certain extent. Whoever Isaiah you Coe. want to throw out there. Isaiah Coe. I would feel really, 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 really confident about yeah. this defense. They could be really, really good. It's just going to be, like you said, Kerry, I think it's going to be uh, pretty dependent or relied upon how good those guys are up the middle. Yeah. I think they have the potential. Linebacker's good. Safety feels good. Quarterback it, feels okay. I think if they can add... option at Cheetah. If yeah. they can add one more body on the defensive line, like Eddie's saying, I think they have the potential to be like a top... 25 top 30 defense in the country which i think you know historically at all of brent stops year three has been a drastic improvement from even the improvement that was made from year one to year two oh right, josh look look at probably the best ou defense in my eyes the one that i think of when i talk about like great OU defense was 2001. That was their third year with Roy and uh, Teddy and uh, Kalmus and Tommy Harris was the, you know, the freshman defensive tackle up the middle. I mean, they just had dudes on dudes and that's kind of what this looks like guys. And to me, a defensive tackle, and I I know it's basically what you guys are saying, but I think you could find a John Terry out there somewhere. And I think yeah. if you found that caliber of player, you're feeling pretty good yeah. about it. Like you're no, feeling you had, like this is a pretty good group. If you had three guys, and I think Jacob Lacey would have been included in that, that are of similar skill set to John Terry, you know, and maybe you know, maybe some of the guys we've been talking about step up in that. Well, you know, I'll tell you, Jaden Jackson. Some of the stuff that we've heard coming out of camp about Jaden Jackson yeah. is he's, he could be that guy as a freshman, right? He's he's gonna. He's going to play quite a bit. Um, and maybe Ashton Sanders is that guy. Or maybe Marcus Strong is that well, guy. Well, even De Devon Sears is the other Devon name Sears that, could be that we've kind of heard about quite a bit, too. I mean, he's been a guy that I think it was one of the players said that he's uh, the strongest player on the team. I think it's fair to like, say, too, that we've heard a lot about, you know, Sears, it sounds like that had a pretty good spring. It sounds like Halton has Halton. had a pretty good uh, spring and also just in scrimmages, he's excelled uh, well. I just, it, it's it kind of goes back to the other idea that, you just don't know, are they beating guys in front of them that are at the level that they need to be? Right. right, right. I mean, again, the reality is, is like, I love spring football because we get to talk about all this stuff, but some of this stuff is just never going to come fruition to the fall anyways. Like, it's sure. just... And a lot of... It's, it's a lot of third channel sourcing. And, right. You know, you're not seeing everything yeah. with your eyes. Like, we haven't seen a single, you know, team rep we haven't seen any scrimmage action like samuel franklin busts off a big uh touchdown run in the second scrimmage last week is that because he was going against 13 guys is that yeah. because there was a, a hole open by uh you know the first team defense against the third team defensive line like those are just questions that ultimately probably don't matter in the end but at the same time yeah. you know it's something that we talk about i will say that uh, especially in the spring because it, it's it, there's it's a zero sum game. Like Jaden Jackson beats Heath Ozido. Well, I don't know anything about either of these guys at this yeah. level. Like, I don't know what, you know, like if you're telling me, you know, like Eddie mentioned Samuel Franklin, okay, he breaks out of Danny Stutzman's tackle or he beats Billy Bowman to the, okay, now we're talking, like, I have some frame of reference to the caliber of player he's going against. But a lot of the times, especially along, along the line of scrimmage right now, where we have so many unknowns. It's uh okay, that guy looks good, 
but you know he's inexperienced. The guy he's going against is inexperienced. There's no there's no way to grade it. Like it, 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 even if you're sitting there watching, you know, people that know what they're looking at, it's still tough to gauge. All right. Uh, it, really good discussion. Uh, there's a lot left in spring. I mean, you're going to go out and see a lot on, on uh, April 20th. Uh, Bob Prisbillo is joining us now. Anything that you wanted to add on the discussion about offensive line, defensive line? No, I, I think we just know they're going to have to hit it. Now, how, how, how many they go for, that's up for discussion. And do, do they lose anyone? I, I think that I, I look at, you know, we see a lot of the spots where OU feels set and we're kind of wondering, will they be able to keep to, to keep them all? But what if they were to lose a defensive, like a, a champ Sanders or something like that, and the person didn't feel he was getting the chance that he needed? How, how quickly this could be like a one-person deal until like two or three just to try to feel comfortable going into the summer. Well, I, I think the other thing, too, and we'll make this kind of the last thing and move on, but um, the personnel department, like it's it's growing. Um, they're, they're putting things into place. Like how much is that going to have a role in, you know, the restructuring that they've done? They've got three recruiting people now versus just having one in the past. Uh, they're, they're adding, you know, assistant GMs to kind of work things. And I think you'll see, you'll hear some announcements on that soon. Um, but you know, are, you know, how much are they actively working? You know, not tampering, but working to identify, you know, who those guys could be. Uh, and, and I think you're always keeping your ear to the ground, just like I'm sure there are people keeping their, you know, they've got feelers into the Oklahoma program, like who's likely to come out in yep. the spring. I mean, you're not doing your job and that is tampering in a way, but you're not doing your job if you're not trying to kind of sit there with a net waiting to catch what comes into the portal. And, and you think of all the changes that happen between Alabama and Washington and all, all that, like. I think the next two weeks will be very intriguing, and we'll see, you know, where programs start start poaching from, and does OU get included in that? Because I, when we look at you know safeties and linebackers, and you love those groups, and like how can all those guys feel content with the role that they're about to play? Because not all of them are going to see the field as much as maybe they deserve and definitely as much as they feel they they should be out there. And Josh, wouldn't you think that part of doing that job as, as a personnel person in a, in a college football department now is going back and looking at recruiting classes and saying, hey, you know, or, or working with the coaches saying, hey, you, which of these guys did you like coming out? Uh, that were four stars or five stars that aren't really making an impact where they are right now, uh, trying to kind of put feelers out and see, you know, is that guy unhappy? Is that guy looking at making a move? Because we believe that he has physical talent. Guys, with, with the NFL draft like coming right around the corner, there's a really interesting parallel between these two things. Where I was listening to Daniel Jeremiah talk the other day, and he was talking about these teams taking, you know, the the 30 – the, the top 30 visits where the guys can come to the, you know, to the NFL camps and or campuses and see everything. Well, he was talking about, he goes, you know, most of the time you'd walk in and you've got eight to 10 guys that we're really serious. We kind of know they, they, we want those guys to be our guys. And then you've got, you know, uh, 20 other options. And he goes, sometimes we're bringing those guys in as a smoke screen and usually not. And he goes, that that's you, you don't want to waste these things. There's only, there's only so many you have. But he goes, a lot of times what we're doing is getting all that information. You know, we're sizing them. We're, we're, you know, how big are they? How, and so down the road, if they become a free agent, we know we, we've got them mapped out. We know what they were. We know, you know, what this looked like. We've done the health test. So when we run a check, you know, six years later, we know, okay, that knee's got some scar tissue that wasn't there, you know, six years ago. We, we, they can go through all those, that information. I think that's kind of, what you can see sometimes, you know, when, when OU brings in a guy and I'll say, Hey people, I don't like OU's chances here. They can be setting up things for the future with the way the portal now works. They can say, Hey, you know, this isn't a guy we're going to get this go around, but he's signing at Georgia with four other top 50 defensive linemen. One of those guys is going to wash out. And if it's him, 
then, hey, maybe we can snag him later in the game and he can come help us, you know, as a junior instead of right now. The token visit doesn't exist anymore. All visits mean something because you never know what's going to happen. And most of the guys on the in the portal, you get them on campus, you damn sure probably don't want to let them leave without signing something or at least getting a verbal. Well, and that's what I saw. What did uh, I, I still don't know how to say his name. The Blydel guy, like he rearranged his visits just yesterday, I think, too, didn't Philip he? Philip Bleedy or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Yep. The guy from Indiana. Indiana defensive tackle. I know that's a that's a game. They You know, he announced he was coming in earlier. Or I think George talked to him and he said he was coming in the week earlier. And then he said, no, I made well, a mistake. Posted. He posted yeah, he it posted. earlier. And, and then like, Whoops, he, he said, fault. I made a mistake. I'm co-. So it's obvious Oklahoma talked him into, no, we want you here this weekend. Spring game weekend. Yeah. Exactly. Well, how much and, and totally not important. He goes to Washington and then he canceled his visit to Arizona. Like how much can Arizona fans <laughs> hate? Like I, they Jed are fish is like Jed the fish mortal enemy. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But I mean, it's it, to me, it is that it is identifying guys that you believe are talented because you're Oklahoma. You can say, look, we're struggling. We have open positions. You've been struggling to to win a starting job where you are for two, three years. We can promise you that you have a real shot of starting here, and we think that you're talented. And then you you know then you got to add in the NIL component which I know with the Indiana guy that's going to be a big deal and why they're kind of shuffling to get him in when he's coming in but it's so many things playing together but I just think you have to start there I'd imagine you probably start there with trying to identify people that aren't in the portal but you think if they were would really help your team IE tampering legally it's the tampering Again, pod, like, pod, podcast we are pro tampering <laughs> If you're if you're not tampering, you're not trying. I mean, we're we're just going Al Davis here. Like, let, let's just let's get to it. It might be the new T-shirt that we put up for sale. All right, um, lots of great. Not a bad idea. I gotta like that. <laughs> okay, we might run with that. Okay, a uh, lot of stuff going on besides football. It's spring. Uh, Eddie has been out at baseball. You're out late last night, right? Baseball. Well, uh, it turned into a late one. Yeah, it turned into a late <laughs> night. It, it wasn't a late night, and then it turned into a relatively... Uh, it wasn't terribly What's late. going on with game. OU baseball? I think that's just the main thing. For people that are kind of I mean, looking from 10,000 feet up. Yeah. Overall, it, it's crazy to talk about it because you talk about a baseball team that, uh, you know, obviously has not played well over the last three weeks. You put your, uh, yourself in position to win a series up in Stillwater over the weekend. Can't get it done. You melt down in the seventh inning. Uh, but at the same time, you walk out of the weekend, you're still tied for first place. So it's it, it's really strange. Like, TCU sucks. They are not a good baseball team. That thing is headed definitely in the wrong direction for Kirk Sorlus. Uh, at the same time, you have probably one of the best weekends in college baseball this season in sweeping Central, Central Florida. Florida yep. So it's, it's really kind of strange. I think that they're trying to identify some arms on the back end that can throw strikes, which, mm-hmm. you know, obviously isn't a good situation to be in. I thought the Grant Stevens made a pretty good start on Sunday. Uh, Witherspoon was good on Saturday. Uh, Braden Davis was relatively pretty good on Friday night. So I think that like the, the weekend rotation has kind of ironed itself out. It's just finding people on the back end that you can depend on. Uh, you know, last night it's one of those things. It's like, it's nine, nothing after the fourth inning. And, I, we talked to Skip about this after the game, wrote about it. At some point, you got to get these guys in, especially freshmen like Jacob Golston, who's going to have an extremely bright future. Uh, but when it gets on the bound, it's not great. <laughs> you can't find the strike zone. So uh, you got to be able to find ways to get some of these guys opportunities to develop. But at the same time, when you're in the position that Oklahoma's been in, uh, because the schedule has been tough, because you haven't won uh, you know, enough games to really kind of give yourself uh, wiggle room in the midweek, you have to win midweek games now. And uh, you know, it certainly hasn't helped that the midweek uh, schedule has had Dallas Baptist on it twice. They have the number one strength of schedule in the country for a reason. Uh, so like, it's just it's really completely bizarre uh, right now in talking about the OU baseball team because it's not like just I think a lot of people would look at it and go, oh, they just they suck, they're awful. It's not that. Like, it's a good team. They've had some bad moments for sure. Uh, But now you're starting to climb out of this thing. So, uh, K State this weekend's a big series. I mean, they're a game behind OU right now in the Big 12 standings. They've been a decent team all year. Uh, Good news is, and we'll see how it goes, but 
I think there's a good chance John Spikerman's back in the lineup this weekend. He took batting practice in Stillwater last week. Uh, he's been available to pinch run if they ever were to need him. He hasn't had that opportunity, or Oklahoma hasn't put him in that opportunity yet. But I think there's a good chance that he like is back in the lineup this mm, week, which wow. is kind of incredible considering we were talking about him less than a month ago coming off the Hammett bone surgery. Uh, it'll it'll just be interesting. Like I I feel like there are going to be some grander takes here over the next couple weeks that like to see where this thing is at. Can you beat K-State? Can you go on the road at, to BYU and take care of business? No midweek game next week because of the Thursday through Saturday experience like Bob you had with softball this past weekend, uh, or I mean coming up this weekend. Uh, it'll be interesting to see where this thing is at. But, you know, all, all in all, they're still working their way somehow in the yeah. mix for like the Big 12 title, which is kind of incredible. I, it might say a little bit more about just kind of where this conference is as a whole. I, I don't think that there's like a really, really good team that you could turn to and say, that team's going to be in Omaha at the end of the yeah. year. But baseball is such a weird thing. It's like, get Somebody hot at the right hot. time, yeah. and mm-hmm. you know, all of a sudden you're looking up. Well, uh, we kind of buried the lead a little They're bit. They're not the but- scumbags of the university this, <laughs> this weekend, the baseball team, <laughs> softball team. Softball I mean, team. What, a, what a failure they are. <laughs> Bob... Uh, I mean, it, was, it wasn't It was like they went and got their heads kicked in, but, you know, it could have been a lot worse in the second game. They got the uh, runner leaving early that would have made it 4-1, kept it at 2-1, and then they lose 2-1. to one. The bats just were not there this weekend in Austin. Yeah, and very surprising just because, remember talking to Patty Gasso and Kenzie Hansen and Alyssa Brito uh, last Tuesday, and they were fired up for this. Like, they want to see where they stand. Like, there's no overlooking, no overconfidence because – OSU just took two or three against Texas. They were going to Austin ready to show what this 2024 team is all about. And you have, you know, the way that Saturday ended with Maya Bland being thrown out the plate for the final out. And, you know, Patty's message is, all right, show the country, show the, the softball world who you are on Sunday. So that's why it's a little concerning because the message was sent Saturday night. It's like, okay, it's – we, we we dropped this one. We didn't make the adjustments in time against the their uh, pitching staff. Now on Sunday, we're going to show everyone who we are once again, and it's two to one for the second straight time. So you, you have a lineup full of just experience, production, 400 hitters up and down that entire, you know, batting lineup. But for whatever reason, you know, give maybe it's more of a credit to Texas than it is a knock on OU. Maybe Texas is legitimately, you know, a top two team for the rest of the season. Well, and how I mean, I, I've seen it, but just kind of talk about how Patty has reacted to this. Is I mean, obviously she's always looking for you know ways to motivate her team, and when they're playing really well, they don't really have to listen to her all that much. But uh, is this something? I mean, obviously, you look at. I saw Georgia and Tennessee playing. Uh, who is it? Um, Duke is the other team kind of in the mix there. Yeah, Duke, Duke's a top five team. Yep. So then Oklahoma and Texas. So I mean, you've got all these teams that are bunched up. You're going to have highs and lows. And like I said, it wasn't that big of a low. You know, you lose two games, two to one. But this seems to be where you know for Patty, it could be a launching point to get this team to take it to another level. And she wasn't happy about Tuesday night. I mean, it was seven nothing in the top of the second inning and Wichita State made a pitching change and then Patty pulled out a lot of the usual starters and she's like, we should have already been on the bus by now. Like, we should not have gone the full seven innings, stay at 7 nothing, shut out for the final five frames. Like, this is a... What's weird about the next three weekends is they should dominate all three of them and if they don't, you know, if, if they do, people won't care. But if they don't, people will notice because now everyone's like, OK, was Texas a real show of what this team is? And then Bedlam will give us another idea. But BYU, Houston, Central Florida, none of that screams like any sort of fear or like concern. And so it will be another month where it's going to be their mindset, their mentality and about trying to get to that level that they know they need to reach when they get to make. I'm curious if the Texas series ends up being something that kind of hurts the psyche of Nicole May a little bit because she pitched so well. And, you know, I've been critical in the past, not critical, but just 
noting that she doesn't really have an out pitch. And it seems like that's starting to develop a little bit. She was getting some strikeouts uh, early, and all of a sudden it just kind of falls apart for her. And falls apart, once again, means two 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 runs. Yes. <laughs> he gave up two runs in all three games. But if, if, if you're, you're OU, comparing you're her to three an OU pitcher that can lead a team to a championship, which – that's what she's competing against. She's competing against a Jordy Ball. She's competing against a Kelly Maxwell. Like you're just waiting for her to kind of take the reins of that ace role, and it just is yet to well, happen. I don't think she's I, ever going to. I think Kelly Maxwell yeah. is is your ace, and what Kirsten Deal. But you're going to need to, someone, you know, to step up. Kelly Maxwell's not infallible. I mean, she she's can not. No, I mean, you're going to need somebody to she's come close. in there. She's she, been pretty damn good. She has been, but she's I'm just saying, hard, hard there are times even when Jordy Ball, you know, you had more some struggles. One. I mean, you need one other dominant pitcher. In I, I think it's Kirsten Deal. Now, I don't, I'm not saying May isn't it, but I, I think Deal will be ready for the moments that come with the regional, the super regionals, and I think May is as steady as they get. They don't have the one dominant, but they've got, I think, a better core with this three that will have them ready for whatever needs to happen during the final stretch. Could it also be just as simple as Texas pretty damn good? Yes. Like in Oklahoma, and maybe this speaks to where they have been over the last two or three years, that they've just been so much better. And now that gap's a little bit yep. smaller, which in turn, you're actually losing games. And Your margin of error. Yeah. Goes, and is, what yeah. you're seeing is you know, Texas and Cowgirls, they've got the pitching staffs too, where they're not relying on one arm. They can go three or four deep. They can go to a Sunday of a game three series and throw three or four arms and feel comfortable about all of them. It's not just OU that has this luxury of this deep, deep staff where you don't know who's pitching and how to, you know, get prepared to go against them. There's other teams that are like that too, and that's going to make postseason very intriguing. Well, guys, it's no different to me than in any other sport. I mean, why did Georgia become Georgia? Because they were chasing Alabama. So Texas yeah. and Oklahoma State have been t- chasing Oklahoma, and Oklahoma's they know that, made the sport better. Yes, one hundred percent. But they've also made everyone around them better. One hundred percent. Yeah, one hundred percent. Everybody looked at what Oklahoma and Patty Gasol was doing, uh, and you know, I'm sure that I don't even know if Mike White has talked about it before, but I'm sure he's looked at Norman and gone, "Oh shit, we got to do this," and in turn, they've they've been able to do that. All right. Um. So. I don't know that we've addressed did the Jalen Moore stuff happen after the pod Saturday. last week. It was Saturday. Saturday. Yeah. Yep. Um, so Enjoying Pearl soccer game. Boom. Jalen Moore says, now, I got I to get to work. Now, as it stands, Porter doesn't have a single player on the roster. <laughs> I mean, that that is how it technically stands, but I, it was just something out of this world would have to occur for Jalen Moore to not return to OU. It's... Every, you know, these players get this option. You can go through the draft process. Don't hire an agent. Just go through the workouts, get the feedback, hear from what they want you to become better at next season, and then return. He's got, you know, more than a month that he has to make this type of decision. And you've seen the way that OU has used Jalen Moore in terms of social media graphics, in terms of hosting transfer portal recruits. Like, they don't believe for a second that more will be leaving uh, Sooners and going into the draft, but it it hurts nobody unless it gets weird. It would hurt nobody for him to go through this process and learn this is what I've got to get better at. And you have so many names in the portal of basketball. Um, hell, you have coaches in the portal, um, but it does seem like Oklahoma's name shows up on a lot of lists. That looks promising, but I know you've got to finish. You got to have some yep. NIL coffers. Uh, is this? I mean, obviously, we're going to look at this and judge Porter a lot by how he rebuilds this roster because there are so many people showing interest in Oklahoma. Start, and it starts this weekend. With Sean Padula, formerly of Edmund Memorial and Virginia Tech. You know, when he hit the portal, we all thought, okay, when? Not if, when? Just go ahead and make this happen. And, you know, when a couple of weeks, you start to wonder. But now it's circling back to where everyone feels confident about this happening. And give credit to OU. They are prioritizing those former in-state kids. Kevin Overton from Drake, Padula from Virginia Tech. They want to land them as quickly as possible and start building this portal class. You get those two, now you're just down to three. Now the problem from there becomes 
you're just on the peripheral of some of these guys. You're in like a top six or you're in like a top eight, but you don't know if you're closer to one or two or seven or eight when it comes to any of these guards. And then there is not a single big in the portal at this moment where I would confidently say, OU is like 1A or 1B for that kid. So that's going to have to change. Portal windows open till May 1st. Still a lot of stuff that's going to happen. A lot more centers are starting to enter, which is good. Because you didn't like when there's just like the kid from Rutgers, Brandon Garrison, the kid from Stanford. Like there's not enough to spread around. Now you're starting to get a lot more depth in that position to where maybe you can start to become a real option. Where's Kareem Abdul-Jabbar ending up? St. Louis. The entire, ah, damn the it. entire starting lineup is just... Damn it. <laughs> I think that they had like a pretty unique relationship too. I think Schertz basically gave an opportunity that nobody else would. And strangely enough, I know it's a private school, but St. Louis has tons of money. Yeah. Like not Arkansas money, but they have some money. Uh, I think Schertz is getting like over $2 million a Jesus. year, which is kind of insane considering that... Uh, you know, that I, I don't You're know. You're going to have little outliers like that. I mean, it's just going to Especially happen. in basketball. Yeah. Yep. Especially in basketball. All right. Um, Josh, before we get out of here, I know there's more to come in recruiting, kind of preview uh, what's ahead for the Sooners in football. A couple, couple hours, yeah. really. <laughs> Got to get this down. Yeah, yeah. There's, um, you know, the news that uh, Trent Wilson will uh, make his decision this evening. I guess it's not news, but he will make his decision tonight. Um there's kind of different um, takes on when exactly that's going to happen. I, I would say any time after five central, you need to be kind of on alert that, that something that. could happen. So we'll, we'll, we'll kind of keep it to that because there's uh, you, you hear different stories on when that's exactly going to happen. But um, still like, still really like where Oklahoma is. Uh, and you'll have to bear with me. I have my headphones and um, – Accidentally hit the play button and started getting some Taylor Swift coming through my uh, through my headphones. My girls were watch listening to their music this morning, so yeah, I got that going. But uh, now that I'm, <laughs> I'm back with it, um, so you, you have that going on. Uh, Darian Coleman um, is going to visit tomorrow. That is expected to be one of Oklahoma's primary targets at quarterback in uh, in 2026. And there, there are some that that think something could happen. So that's another guy we got to kind of watch. But yeah, I, you know, it should be an interesting weekend. They've got several quarterbacks. They just had Jaden O'Neal, the big time guy from California that I really like. Um, really enjoyed his visit. He talked about Oklahoma. You know, talked with our guy Steve Wiltfong. Said uh, Oklahoma just kind of set the standard for him. You know that, that that's what visits are going to be compared to. So. Again, a lot of a lot happening in recruiting. Guys are kind of in and out of campus. There are several other offers that will be there over the next few few days, and then as we head into, um, you know, we're a little over a week away from the spring game, and we start to really nail down who will be on campus for that uh, that always big event. All right, and by the way, just real quick, uh, we didn't really hit on the uh, the uh, Heisman um, hangout. Uh, Eddie's mm-hmm. boy Sammy B was in town. Indeed, Did you get to catch up a little bit. I haven't talked to him. Damn, Sam. Talk to your boy. It's a busy week. It's Masters week. It's a he- This is your third show today, your morning show. You did the OK Breakdown. You're doing this. You're doing the family business with Brad Dalkey coming up. Uh, so, Eddie, is this is his time to shine. I got note cards. I got everything ready to go. Wow. It's impressive. You see Port- Portnoy put like a $300,000 bet yeah. on Scheffler? When you're hot, you're hot. He, he'll win he like three million. million if yeah, he, he just won two and a half million on uh, the UConn, um, the national championship game on the futures there. Uh, so anyway, that's something to look forward to. Uh, but uh, few, uh, Heisman hangout, Josh, real quick. What was your biggest takeaway from that? Uh, I would say uh, probably at a position that we haven't talked a lot about uh, with some of the reviews I've gotten from Dawson Merritt. I've had a chance to talk with him a little bit over the last few days. And I, guys, I mean, it's never bad when you're in a linebacker battle. And I think it might come down to Alabama and Oklahoma. That that's kind of my read on him right now. Um, I think Oklahoma is where he is really strongly connected. He really likes the staff. He likes Brent Venables. He likes uh, you know uh, he likes what he's how he's gotten to know Zach Alley over the last couple months. And then you with Alabama, it's Alabama. You know, like you you just it is kind of that deal, but. That's where we're going to kind of see. That's one of the interesting tests this year where I think that's what that's how Oklahoma lost Casey Poe last year. 
I think he likes Bill Biedenbo the best. I think Oklahoma was the staff he had the best relationship with, but he chose Alabama largely because they're Alabama. Does that still continue now that Nick Saban and you know so much of that staff is no longer there? It may. I, 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 that's an answer I, I don't have yet, but I think it's going to be interesting to see in this first class post Nick Saban how much of the lure of Alabama is the school's name and how much of it was Nick Saban and we're going to kind of figure out the math on that as we go forward. All right, good stuff. Uh, lots more to come uh, throughout the week. We'll have that practice access on Friday. Uh, stickball this week, boys? Going stickball? We'll, uh, we'll let softball take the lead on that one this week. So, uh, Also, the family business coming up with Brad Dalkey. Give you a little bit of a master's preview. Uh, all that gets underway tomorrow. Eddie's currently watching practice rounds and baseball at the same time. Well, it's the par three course. That was a par, par three, three contest. Today. That's that's fun because all the caddies, kids all the kids, all, that, yeah. all the kids are out there. So anyway, a uh, great weekend of sports coming up. Then we got the spring game coming up next week, and uh, lots more to come on YouTube. Go check us out. Also, you can get in on all the action for just a dollar uh, on Soonerscoop.com. Uh, go sign up, just a dollar for a full month, and uh, you can get all the information that we're putting out there. So thanks everybody for listening. We'll be back again next week for another edition of the Unofficial Forty Podcast right here on Soonerscoop.com podcasts.